Grace to you and peace. Welcome to worship at Hickory Hills Presbyterian Church. We are thankful to have you with us today. I have just a few announcements for you this morning. The first is a thank you to those of you who stuck around the two Sundays. I asked you to stay after worship and talk about the direction of the church, our hopes, and our vision. I promise that there will be a summary coming out probably in the October newsletter for those of you who were there and wondered what in the world I was asking you to think about, and for those of you who were not able to stick around. And so that will be out. There's incentive for you to actually read your newsletter. Um, the mini faith walking retreat that I have been inviting you to for a few weeks now is actually this coming Saturday. On 9-11, we're going to meet at 10 a.m. We will be done by 1 p.m. I have about 12 people coming. I would love to have some more of you come to that if you are interested in wondering what in the world is this thing that I keep inviting you to that is faith walking. Also, there's no commitment necessary to it after that. So it's free of charge, and you're not being asked to sign up for anything. We're going to talk about Sabbath, and we're going to talk about anxiety. So if those are things that are resonating with you and you're thinking, yeah, but I'm not signing up for faith walking, that's okay. Come and let's learn together about a couple of these things. So there's still time to sign up. There's a sign-up sheet out and back, but I would appreciate it if you would sign up so I know how many seats to plan on. Our mission this month is Church World Service. We are sending monies to assist with the Afghanistan refugees, with Haitian cleanup, with the South. Church World Service is an active organization in all of those places already. And so we know that they are a good organization and we want to support their efforts. So there is a bucket in back if you want to make a donation in direction to, this, organ to help with any of those disasters. That is the um, best way that we have to support the work, is to support what is already being done on the ground financially. Two more things. We are headed into fall, which means things start up again around here. Women's Bible study begins on the 13th, which would be a week from tomorrow. If you want to come and learn about women of the Bible, that's what we're going to be working on this year at 1 p.m. on Mondays. And then our next drive through community meal is also on the 13th, and that will be from 5.30 to 6. If you want to help out, let Debbie Zimmerman or Evelyn Garlic know you want dinner and don't have to cook that day, drive up. We will literally give you food to eat, and we're having spaghetti. Are there any other announcements? Anything I'm missing? Then let's prepare our hearts, and let's worship our God together. Good morning, and, and welcome to all of those who are not able to escape the city for a final summer weekend fling. We welcome you here. And remember, this is just one of the days the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. We'll ask you to join me in the call to worship. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will sing praises to my God all my life long. Happy are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, their God. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the strangers, upholds the orphan and widow. But the way of the wicked shall be brought to ruin. The Lord will reign forever, your God for all generations. Praise the Lord. You, O oh God, are mighty forever. You cause the wind to blow and the rain to fall. You sustain the living, give life to the dead, support the falling, loose those who are around. And keep your faith with those who sleep in the dust. 
Who is like you, O God of mighty acts? Praise be to you forever. Our hymn, first hymn this morning is, We Are Standing on Holy Ground, number 406. Stand if you feel like it. If not, just sing along. When we gather to praise God, we remember that we are a people who have often preferred our own way to God's, that we are a people who have often wandered or forgotten God's claim upon our lives. Accepting God's invitation to become a new creation in Christ begins with letting go of our past. Together then, let us confess our sins and leave them at the foot of the cross. Join me, please, in this prayer of confession. Jesus, who sat at the table with outcasts and sinners, we confess that too often our words and actions are not consistent with what we say we believe. We are guilty of assumptions and snap judgments. We prefer the company of those we know and trust rather than those you have commanded us to love. We judge our enemies and find it difficult to pray for them. Forgive us, we pray. Empower us to reach out in love and acceptance through your name. Amen. People of God, Hear the good news. Who is in a position to condemn? Only, Only Christ. Christ. And Christ, Christ died for us. Christ, Christ rose for us. Christ, Christ reigns in power for us. Christ, Christ prays for us. us. Anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old life has gone. A new life has begun. Know that you are forgiven and be at peace. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Our New Testament reading this morning comes from the book of James, second chapter beginning with the first verse. My brothers and sisters, do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our gracious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes also comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, well, to the one who is poor, you say, stand there 
or sit at my feet. Have you not made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters, has not God, God chosen the poor in the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who oppresses you? Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. This is the word of God. Thanks. People of God, our gospel today comes from the gospel of Mark. This is chapter 7. We're going to begin at verse 24. From there, Jesus set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know that he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast out the demon from her daughter. He said to her, let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying this, 
you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The story of Jesus is shocking for all of its bluntness. In the words that Jesus uses, did he really just call someone a dog? Did we read that right? We are used to the idea that Jesus cared for people. He cared about the least. He was willing to go to hard places, have conversations with the people who did not belong. Jesus was willing to touch and talk to the people who nobody else would. So if all of that is true, what's going on in this story? Because this seems contradictory. It seems different, right? Maybe Mark shouldn't have included this story in his gospel. Maybe Jesus was just having a really bad day and snapped, because we've all done that. What's actually going on? And what does it have to do with you and I? First, we need to back up a little bit. Do you remember what passage we read last week? Do you remember the story that we read? Jesus was criticizing the scribes and the Pharisees for their obsession with outward appearances. There was this whole conversation about eating food the right way, washing your hands in the right way, making sure that the utensils that you were using had been cleaned the proper way before you began to eat. And Jesus then challenged the insider rules, the assumptions of the Pharisees. Jesus broke down barriers. He said that it's not what you put in, it's what comes out of you that is unclean. Jesus challenged the, those who are in the, on the inside know the right thing to do, and those who are on the outside are the ones that don't know what to do. What makes a person clean is what comes from in their heart. It is from our hearts that theft and murder and adultery and greed and pride come, Jesus says. If our hearts are in the wrong place, then evil comes from us. These are the things that make us unclean. And so it seemed, yes, last week, that Jesus wasn't at all concerned with the rules of purity, was he? He was taking away the things that people use to create boundaries and keep certain people out and only let certain people in. Jesus was worried about the state of a heart, their faith, and whether or not they were being nurtured and fed. So let's hold on to that conversation from last week as we enter into this strange story of Jesus seeming to contradict everything he just said a few verses earlier. From that conversation, we are told that Jesus heads off to the region of Tyre. Tyre is the boondocks of Galilee, which were the boondocks of Israel. You catch what I'm saying? Jesus wasn't just in the middle of nowhere in a backwater. He was in the backwater of the backwater. Tyre was a place that no one wanted to go. It was a refuge for the outsiders. This is the region of Galilee where all the Gentiles lived, where the nobodies and the unclean gathered together. The insiders wouldn't have wanted to spend much time there. So what's Jesus doing there? Why did Jesus go to Tyre? Maybe he's on a retreat. Maybe he's trying to hide away from everyone else. We're told that he didn't want to be known to be there, and yet he could not escape Notice, having declared that being unclean is a state of the heart, maybe Jesus is going to prove his point by going and hanging out with people who don't follow the insider rules. But Jesus attracts a crowd everywhere he goes, even in the places where people are unclean. So put yourself in his shoes for a minute. In the middle of his ministry, surrounded by crowds, Constantly, people hanging on his every word, constantly being confronted by the sick, 
and the tormented. Jesus is constantly surrounded by those who need him and want him, who look for his wisdom, they look for his care, they are constantly seeking. And so I imagine that he's maybe a little bit tired when he heads off to Tyre. Maybe his hope is to take a break. He enters a house and wants no one to know he's there. He's welcomed as an honored guest because that's how you treated traveling preachers. So what happens next is shocking and extraordinary, but not for the reasons that we think in our modern day. We wince at this story because Jesus says to somebody that it's better for the children to be fed first than to waste it on the dog. And that is hard for us to hear. Because in our world, you don't talk to people like that. And if you do, the rest of the world around you is appalled. Because we do know people who do that. Maybe we're even guilty of it. But we know that you shouldn't talk to people that way. And so Jesus says this thing, but we have to go deeper. Because Jesus is a first century male Jew And so what we have to understand is that what Jesus says is not shocking or appalling. Jesus says what any other man at that time would have said. Jesus responds criticizing the woman, and it wouldn't have been a shock at all to those who were around Jesus that he said this to this woman. What is extraordinary is the woman, her persistence. She has been dismissed by someone who holds power over her, and rather than accepting what he says, she pushes back and challenges it. She demands that he pay attention. She demands that her daughter receive a blessing. She will not be dismissed, not even by the teacher. Her response would have appalled the host and the rest of the household. Even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs, she says. Who does she think she is talking back? What is she doing? Who is this Gentile woman to talk back to a Jewish teacher, to a Jewish man of God? You can almost imagine this really embarrassed, awkward silence settling over the room as everybody is shocked by her audacity and her brazenness and no one's sure if they should acknowledge what she just said or pretend like she's not there. Jesus responds to her argument. Jesus is moved by her demand. Jesus not only responds to her, but he acknowledges that she has a right to share in the blessings of God, something that no one ever would have done in the Jew-Gentile conversation. Remember, the Gentiles are the outsiders. They're the nobodies. They don't belong. They are unclean. And yet Jesus acknowledges that this woman has the right to demand something from God. He radically breaks with his culture and acknowledges that even those who are seen as on the outside can trust in God and receive blessings from God. This is a radical departure from the assumptions of culture and the way that people thought the world worked in the first century. The people of Israel during Jesus' time were surrounded by the other Remember that Rome had taken over the region long before Jesus was born. The emperor of Rome ruled Israel through his governors and through the kings he appointed. The issue of who belonged, who had a right to God's blessing, was a really important argument in Jesus' day. Because those who would receive God's favor... Those who God approved of would one day be rescued from Rome and restored. Eventually, God was going to destroy those who were outside of God's house. And that is the context that Jesus then turns to this woman 
and acknowledges that she has the right to demand blessings from God. Those on the outside didn't belong, and those on the inside worked really, really hard to keep themselves clean and pure and set apart. They needed to be kept clean from the heretics and the non-Jews and those who did not belong. Preferential treatment was intended for God's people, not for anyone else. The assumption of favor, that God's favor rested with them, was one of the things that kept the Jewish people going in the midst of the Roman occupation. We're not immune from this assumption of blessedness, are we? This assumption that we are somehow unique and blessed by God. We in the U.S. have often claimed God's preference or favor, sometimes for our denomination, sometimes for our nation. Both preachers and politicians have claimed that we have special status, a particular blessing from God. The assumption of favor can be deeply dangerous. The assumption that we are particularly blessed, that our family, our clan, our church, our city, or our nation, whatever it is that we are claiming is particularly or uniquely blessed, when we do that, we are in danger of forgetting that God shows no partiality, that God does not show partiality, but that Jesus said, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. When we claim special favor, it's dangerous. Like those before us, we are in danger of forgetting the command given to Abraham that he was to be called blessed so that he could bless the rest of the world. Blessed to be a blessing is the command of God. Blessed and favored for the sake of others does not have the same feel as greatly favored and blessed, does it? Blessed to be a blessing does not feel the same as particularly blessed by God. But we don't need to look any further than Jesus to be reminded of the danger of claiming preference or greater blessing. Jesus spent his ministry challenging the set-apartness of those around him. Jesus invited his followers to look at their lives, how they did things, and why they were choosing to do them. He invited his followers not to look at the outside, but at the inside, to be concerned not at what was outside, but what was living inside the heart. This Syrophoenician woman must have terrified the disciples. She must have been terrifying because she was pushy. This woman was foreign and pushy, and she's talking about a daughter who's possessed by a demon, and clearly she's unclean because she's a Gentile. She must have terrified the disciples. And yet Jesus interacts with her and concedes her argument. He tells her that she's right and that she has a right to ask for God's favor. And then he heals her daughter. This woman's presence in the house would have pushed the disciples to the edge and then way past their comfort level. Even as Jesus seems right at home in the debate, doesn't he? He doesn't seem phased at all in this exchange. Where we are uncomfortable, where we would choose to create barriers and keep certain people out, where we would walk away, or set up boundaries between us and them, where we are made uncomfortable by cries for justice, Jesus seems to be right at home. Where we want to close the door or hide our faces, Jesus chooses to engage and respond. Where we are safe and comfortable and not sure we really want to get involved, Jesus dives in and then drags his disciples along with him on the journey just to make sure that they learn something. 
Jesus didn't kick this woman out of the house. He didn't ignore her. He didn't attack her for her brazenness. He didn't shame her for her demands. He simply responded and said, yes, you are right. Jesus challenges us to look in the mirror as well. What favoritism are we guilty of? Who are the people that you have judged worthy of your attention and who still sits on the outside? Who are we guilty of writing off because they don't fit, look, act the way that we expect? Who are those that we have assumed do not share God's favor? What are those assumptions that are at work when it comes to mercy and welcome? Are there those that you long to welcome, but you're afraid of what other people will think? Jesus confronts us in our boundaries, in the barriers that we set up in terms of who is in and who is out. Jesus confronts us in our favoritism in our preferential treatment, in our assumptions, Jesus reminds us again and again that God's ways are not our ways. And we do well when we ask again, how do we better align ourselves with God's values rather than our own? Amen. We're going to hear from Gabriella. Caleb. People of God, are there joys or concerns that you would share with one another today? Karen. Oh. So your dear friend Jean passed away, leaving, or no, da daughter Susie passed away, leaving a husband, a three-year-old, and so prayers for Jean and for the rest of the family. Other things. Darlene.
The daughter? Okay, daughter. So a friend of Darlene's daughter, Elizabeth, who has been diagnosed with breast cancer. Prayers for her. Yes, Caleb. So Caleb is reminding us to be in prayer for the victims of Ida, for the victims of the hurricane in Haiti, people of Afghanistan. Are there other things? Molly. Molly's asking for prayers specifically for our healthcare workers who are back in the midst of the trenches and who are as exhausted as the rest of us over COVID, if not way more so. Other things. People of God, let us pray together as we prepare our hearts for communion. People, gracious God, this is your table, and it is to be made ready for those of us who love you and who want to love you more. And so we ask that we would come, that we would come before you, not just with the concerns of our hearts, though they are many and heavy, but also with the joys and the hopes that we have as well. And so today, Lord, we pray. We pray for those who are in need, who we love and who we are concerned for. We specifically pray for Kathy and Jeanette. We specifically pray for Lynn, Diane's sister. We pray for Elizabeth. Gracious God, we ask that you would heal and make whole, that you would give comfort to family, that you would give strength where it is needed. Lord God, we pray for those who grieve today, for the victims of Ida and their families, for Jean and the rest of Susie's family. We pray for the people who are exhausted by pandemic, in particular our healthcare workers, who have done so much to care for us. Lord God, our concerns are many and our hearts are heavy because we see the aching of your world and your people throughout the world. And so today we pray for those whose lives have been overturned by hurricanes, for the people of Haiti and the Gulf Coast, for the people of the middle of our country, and for those on the East Coast who have been victims to disaster. We pray for those who have been displaced by fire and for those who are battling the flames. We pray, God, for the people of Afghanistan. We pray for those who are victims. Merciful God, you are a God who knows better than we the needs of those who surround us. And so we pray also today for those concerns and joys and fears and hopes that have been unnamed, but sit heavy upon us. We pray, Lord, for your healing presence and for your grace. As we come before you today, as we gather around your table, it is with gratitude and praise that we come to you. When we were nothing, you made us something. When we had no name, no faith, and no future, you called us your children. When we have lost our way or turned away, you have never abandoned us. When we have come back to you, you have opened your arms wide and welcome. 
You prepare a table for us, not just bread and the cup, but your very self, so that we may be filled, forgiven, healed, blessed, and made new again. You are worthy God of all our pain and all our praise. It is in gratitude for your son Jesus that we pray together the prayer he taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. People of God, on the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. People of God, the bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. And then after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and he poured it out and said, this cup is the New Testament, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it and remember me. The cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. People of God, as we have been fed at the table, let us pray. Lord God, in deep gratitude for this moment and this meal, for these people, we give ourselves to you. Take us out to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, Expect much of us. Enable much by us. Encourage many through us. 
Lord, may we live to your glory, both as inhabitants of earth and citizens of heaven. Amen. Our closing hymn today is How Great Thou Art. And if you are able, I suggest you stand because I think you need it to get the air up and out for this hymn.
people of God, go in peace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be and remain and abide with you now and forever. God's people say, Amen.